Hey, D, take it from Broadway, Bill Lee. You just stay calm, kiss your mom, ban the bomb, do the best you can. God loves you, man. Our studios at KTU at the time were directly across the river from the World Trade Center. I mean, we're all in shock. But the very first reaction I had, I am hopping in my Jeep and I'm going in. Stars. Cars. Guitars. Right. I'm really, oh my goodness, look at this. We've both turned up, Broadway Bill Lee and me, we've both <laughs> turned up at the ball in the same frock. We've got the same specs on. <laughs> How about that? Oh. Must be same mindset, you know? Yeah. All right, I'll take mine off too. No, no, okay. no, no, no. Don't worry, I've got another pair. <laughs> I've got another pair. Love it. So, Bill, thank you very much for joining us. Before we go any further, let's see a little bit of you in action. CBS FM, it's Broadway Bill doing what you've come to expect. Friday, free ride is in full effect. You know, the window shattering, speaker rattling, no commercial prattling. Now, the way home, you got three in the front, three in the back, and I like it like that. Till the whole car starts to stink, stank, stunk. Wowza. Are you never worried you are going to trip over your words when you do that? Oh, sometimes when you have a blowout at 150 words a minute, it can be brutal. Uh, it's happened to me in the past. Uh, <laughs> I, I got to tell you, when I usually rehearse, at least in my head, while I'm listening to a song in cue, about 60 seconds before I actually do a break. So it's not totally, wow, this guy's a genius. He's rapping like, you know, on stage. It's, uh, it's planned out. Pretty much like every hip-hop artist, it's planned out. Not written well, I, down. Not written at all. No scripts. Right. And do you ever remember them and then repeat them a year later? Can you think, oh, that was a really good one. I'll save that. Next time the gap bam, burn rubber on me comes around, uh, I'll let it go a couple of times. Then on the fourth <laughs> time, I'm going to get it. There's an interesting uh, thinking thought process to that. I have some rhymes that I use as signature that I will use at certain times of the day, certain times of the week, certain occasions. Sam, will you cool it? Um, all right, come on up. You can get in. Um, what a ham. I don't know where he gets it. Uh, anyway. Uh, I, I have some that I keep in rotation as signature rhymes. And then there are others, like you say, if it's a great line on burn rubber, I will use it again, but not for about three or four years. I won't do it any sooner than that. Okay. Well, listen, Bill, I won't tell anyone. Now, um, I've not rehearsed anything. I've not prepared anything for this. I, d I did have the glasses planned because I saw you in a video. Right? <laughs> okay, I'll give you that. But look, I found okay. this the other day and I thought of you. This is Wolfman Jack's autobiography. Right? Uh -huh. yeah. Now, I, I looked through it. I haven't read it for about 20 years. But I looked through it the other day because there was one bit in there that I, I, I remembered. And when he, when he was early 90s, he went back to New York and he worked on one of the stations there, I think doing Afternoon Drive. And uh, in, I'm sure it's in this book. He tells the story. The driver would pick him up. And as he went across some bridge over to Manhattan, I don't know which bridge it was, he would get the driver to stop the car. And every night he would get out the car look at Manhattan, breathe it all in and thinking, that's my city. And it sounds so <laughs> cool. Tell me you do the same thing. Not right now because we're in pandemic and I'm working from home. But I have to be honest, uh, at different radio stations I've worked at in New York, I've had different ways of doing that, but the same experience. Uh, when I worked at KTU, we were actually in Jersey, right across the river from the World Trade Center. And I could look right out the window at it and all at downtown Manhattan. And it was just beautiful. You could see the traffic moving on the, on the uh, Hudson. And it was just, I mean, that's the kind of thing that psychs you out when you're on the air. Uh, at uh, CBS, we started out, when I started working at CBS FM, I uh, worked right there at Times Square, and we were 42 stories up. And all you could see out the studio window was the lights of Times Square. So it was here again. I'm talking into the microphone. I'm looking at it, and I'm going, whoa, baby, uh, it, like the Wolfman, you know. And uh, he worked at WNBC doing nighttime. And believe it or not, he actually used to uh, pop in and do weekends at CBS FM, where I work wow. now. 
Yeah. Uh, and there's still a long history of great DJs at CBS FM. And I'd like to think it's part of a line that we all, you know, are in. And, and it's a great thing to have followed Wolfman, Cousin Brucey, Dan Ingram, and a lot of these guys who were icons in New York radio, to be able to follow them in the same path that I'm in now. You know? Well, that is so cool. We'd love to hear more of you. And I remember when, you know, the Internet first exploded, we could hear uh, those guys, Harry Harrison and that every day. And then CBS mm -hmm. and a lot of other radio stations block the signal. So now we have to live on a little bit of YouTube and you on social media. Well, you could get a VPN and uh, tap into a New York address and still hear me, but you didn't hear me say that. Uh, in all honesty, a lot of people in Europe, I can't tell you the number of people in Europe that do that. They just uh, call in with requests or, or, you know, type me something on instant messenger. And I get it. You know, it's great. I'm doing requests for Ireland. This is unbelievable. <laughs> Now, you, I love, like you, personality radio. I think there is a real skill and an art to being a disc jockey. A disc jockey, I guess they're a disc jockey because they ride the music. You've called it surfing, surfing the music. Is, is yeah. that a better analogy for you? Absolutely, because it's all about levels. It's all, all about I want to be in the music, not on top of it. And there's a reason for that. Um, when a person is listening to their favorite song on the radio, let's say they're driving down 86th Avenue cruising in Brooklyn. And I mean, the whole car load of kids is loaded, you know, and they're just got it cranked up. As soon as the disc jockey comes on, if the disc jockey is louder than their favorite song, it's offensive to hear. It's awful to hear. It's terrible. A big voice comes in louder than my favorite rock and roll guitar. That's awful. So what I want to do is always be there, be present, be able to be heard and understood, but just like I'm the lead singer of the song, about that level, right there at that level. So it really is like a surfer inside the curl of a wave. And that's the way I think of it. That's the way I listen to it. And that's the way I try to have it come out of the speakers. Hang on a minute. I just got to make a note. Must turn my microphone down <laughs> too, too loud. Well, it depends, too. I mean, have you got a loud rock and roll song you're introducing? Um, that's when it matters. If you have a soft, quiet song, I'm not going to be yelling, and I'm only still going to be as loud as the lead singer. Won't you please join me in this ballad? You know, that kind of thing. So it, it's a matter of personal you know, control as well as technical control on the board as well. It's Oh Wow Wednesday. Oh wow, that is great. On CBS FM. Yeah, it's Broadway Bill Lee. One of those jaws, not necessarily for a righteous cause or even your applause. Just thinking about being down under in the land of Oz. Where right about now, it's turning from spring to sweet summertime. Where a young man's mind turns to thoughts of the birds and the bees and well, I'll have some rock and roll, please. <laughs> And these boys from Melbourne sure learn how to pop that nookie. And for Jack, the question is still looking. Are you gonna be my girl? One, two, three, take my hand and come with me because you look so fine that I really want to make you mine. When you were growing up in Cleveland, mm -hmm. every when I lived in a um, when I lived in America myself for a year. Every American I met wanted to ask me about two things. One was, did I know the guys from Top Gear, Jeremy Clarkson and co? <laughs> and, and the other was, had I ever met a Beatle? Because every American I'd ever met had watched the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in, in February 1964. Now, sure. someone must have been watching the other side. What did you have? Three channels? No, I, I know a lot of people are watching the Beatles, but someone must have been watching the other side. But they're never going to admit it, are they? I don't think anybody was watching the other side. And I'll tell you why, because it was the baby boom generation. So we were the largest segment of the population. And maybe our parents did control the television when we were young, but we prevailed that night. And I would think a good three quarters to maybe 80 percent of all televisions in America were tuned to that show that night. All three How nights. How old were you uh, in February 64? I was 13. 
Wow. So just yeah. the right age. Just the right age. I put down the microphone because I wanted to be a disc jockey from the time I was five years old. And I had a little Remco, uh, you know, it made it out to the sidewalk with my broadcast. But as soon as the Beatles came on, I put down the microphone and picked up a guitar like every other kid my age. That's all I thought about. And growing up in Cleveland, we all thought about that. Everybody. And Cleveland was very interesting because <laughs> it was a good combination of Motown, soul, and, and British rock. We grew up and put that all together. And that's what was happening in Cleveland while I was a teenager. It was British invasion and Motown soul from Detroit. And that's the way the music was. That's the kind of the way we had a, a funk kind of bottom to our rock and roll in Cleveland. And we all grew up that way. Yeah. Had Did you, me. do you remember, I mean, obviously you remember the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Um, sure. Do you, do you remember the next day at school on the Monday? Um, Absolutely. Remember, what was it like? <laughs> The Monday was exciting. That's all we were talking about. But by Friday, I went to a Catholic school. We had Sister Mary uh, at the Our Lady of Great Agony, you know, and uh, we put on a little show after lunch every Friday. Some kids would get up and recite poetry. Some kids would, uh, you know, do other talents. Uh, four of us got up and did a Beatles song. <laughs> And we were terrible. I mean, we just picked up the guitar three days ago, you know, so we were awful. But we did I Want to Hold Your Hand, I think. And oh, wow. <laughs> so that was the Friday after that Sunday. We were already performing. And so you're, you're, so you're in Cleveland. So I suppose New York's four or 500 miles down the road, but that way. And then the other way, Detroit. So you just got your antenna on your radio when you were a teenager, pointed it in the other direction and you picked up, did you hear the Detroit stations? Because, I mean, hearing Motown in the 60s on American radio must have been fantastic, but hearing it from Detroit, could you get Detroit from where you lived? CKLW, the big eight in the Motor City. The Motor City murder meter to show up and so is your attitude. You know, I mean, it was just killer had a 50,000 clear channel uh watt signal that boomed actually from canada from windsor ontario which was right across the river from detroit and it was a detroit local station and it boomed into cleveland like a local station across lake erie and man <laughs> that's all we cared about it was great the sound had the radio station had great compression it was louder than anything else on the dial and it pumped motown just Pumped it. And were you just going up and down the dial, night in, night out, discovering new channels and new shows and, and, and new DJs? That, in all honesty, didn't happen until I got to college and got so dejected at all the different majors my parents wanted me to try. My father wanted me to be a dentist. Um, I figured it'd probably be good if I got into business administration. I spent a couple of years just knocking around in college, did not feel passionate about anything. So then I just decided, why don't I do what I always wanted to do? Because the rock and roll bands I were in kept breaking up. As one guy wanted to just do a blues band, another guy just wanted to do uh, trance and uh, psychedelia. And uh, it just, nobody could keep it together. So... I just decided, why don't you just do what you always wanted to do and be a disc jockey? That's when it happened. I was probably 20, 21 years old when I started DXing like crazy. That's what we call bringing in out, out of town stations. And so with the AM signals back then, you, I would pull in WLS and WCFL from Chicago. I would listen to WABC in New York. Um, once in a while, I can even pick up uh, some stations from Memphis. Uh, great. There was a disc jockey <laughs> in Memphis called Jonna. And Jonna sounded a lot like Wolfman. And Jonna be talking to you know, all night. And I, <laughs> I found out he was a white dude and it blew my mind. I didn't know you were allowed to do that, impersonate an African-American <laughs> on the radio, even back then in the, in the 70s. 
But uh, that's when I started to listen to a lot of disc jockeys. And as soon as I actually got my first job in radio and then got my second job in radio, I actually became the program director. And I used to get this record once a month called Programmer's Digest. And it had all the news going on in broadcasting, mostly uh, top 40 broadcasting. And it would come with a record, a 12 inch album that had air checks and jingle packages. And all this, I would invite my whole staff over on Friday night. And, you know, we'd order food and we'd listen to that thing all night long drinking. And it would be air checks of different disc jockeys and we'd all get influenced. We'd all allow ourselves to be influenced. We'd, we'd call each other up and go, hey, listen to my next break. <laughs> and it, he'd be stealing a line from somebody's air check, but he executed it perfectly. So that's all that mattered, you know. And we all got influenced. And in all honesty, just about every... I believe this is universal. Every air performer, everyone that presents on the radio is a combination pretty much of everybody they ever liked, everybody they ever tried to emulate. They tried, they weren't trying to emulate them. I was personally trying to copy them. I was trying to do an impression of them. But when I did it, it came out different. And it came out like me. And then I added it to what Cousin Brucey was doing. Then I added it to what Johnny Holliday was doing. I added it to what Wolfman Jack was doing. And by the time I got a few years into the business, I was doing an amalgamation of all of these radio personalities. And I had a trick bag. Right, let's, bag let's, of tricks. let's get into that bag of tricks now. Here's another one of your famous breaks. Today in the Hall of Fame, songs that make you go. Oh, wow. It's an Oh Wow Wednesday. Oh, wow. On CBS FM. It's Broadway. It's time. <laughs> Give the format a flush, because who would rush when you're diving deep into that funky underbrush? Back in 1982, this was the house band downtown at First Avenue, melting the Minneapolis snow, playing so loud the speakers blow. Hey, Jesse, not Jerome. I'm going to funk you up out of the way home. You're known for your, your rapping and your, your, your rhyming. Um, the night John Lennon died, you were on air in San Francisco. And, of course, Correct. we all see these breaks on social media, and we think you spend all your time rapping. That kind of broadcasting um, takes other skills. Um, tell me about that night. That was the first big test that I had when I worked at KFRC, which is it was a West Coast blowtorch. It was one of the two finest radio stations on the West Coast. And I got a job there. And it was great money. And I was excited to be there. And I worked hard every night. And John Lennon died, obviously, on December 8th. And I had been working there two months, all of two months. And when I saw that come over the wire, the uh, teletype machine, I was obviously, first thought, scared to death. Secondly, really in grief. Third, what am I going to do? I had a phone call to the program director, no answer. Phone call to the assistant program director, no answer. Music director, no answer. News director, no answer. So I said, okay, I got to do what I got to do. And so I just went on the air and, and said, John Lennon has been killed. I read the AP News story. And I just went all Beatles. That's all I played. I pulled out every Beatles song we had and just did that for four hours straight. Put listeners on the air. I got on the phones with listeners, some crying, some telling stories, some wanting more information about what's going on. And it was a full four hours of nothing but two minute Beatle records because that's what they were back then. And a lot of phone calls. And it was magnificent trial for me. And at the same time, uh, indelible memory, uh, not only because I grew up with the Beatles, that's one of the reasons I was in rock and roll. Uh, it was everything that night. And when a story happened like this, the last person to interview John Lennon at the Dakota, the day he was killed, the very day, an 
hour before he was killed, Dave Sholin, who was our midday guy and also worked for the RKO Radio Network, had been interviewing John at the Dakota. He gets on a flight, comes back to San Francisco. And as soon as he gets off the plane, he turns on KFRC and I announce that John Lennon is dead. He calls me up immediately. I put him on the air and he tells me the story of having just interviewed John. His new album had just come out. So there was a lot of personal what he poured into the uh, interview, as well as the shock and disbelief and the irony of getting off a plane and hearing that the best interview, the biggest interview you've ever done is now going to be immortalized in history as the last interview with John Lennon. So that made it even more dramatic. And it's been dramatic for both Dave and I ever since then. Anytime the anniversary of John's death comes up, we both get contacted by the press and uh, asked about that night and the experience. And I guess for you, it was another JFK moment because you would have been, what, 12 years old uh, when JFK died. I mean, that... I, I was. I suppose that was more your parents' moment, but as a 12-year-old, you wouldn't have even better get your head around that, would you, that someone could do that to another human? Oh, it was even darker than that because you got to remember, Kennedy was Catholic, and I was going to a Catholic school, and Kennedy, I mean, even the nuns were wearing Kennedy buttons <laughs> during the election. I mean, and, and so he was a favorite at school, and... He became a real hero of mine just because he was so cool and he stood up to the Russians and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, he was uh, always fought for civil rights and actually sent the National Guard down to Alabama in a civil rights case to allow uh, African-Americans to attend college there. I mean, he was cool. We loved him. He was an icon. And when his assassination happened, they stopped everything. Uh, it came over the public address system in our classrooms, and we followed along uh, uh, with the newscasts. Uh, he's been shot. We don't know. Uh, you know, we they had the apprehended uh, uh, shooter, and now, ladies and gentlemen, at one forty-eight, uh, John F. Kennedy has died. You know, and we went through the whole thing. As soon as that happened, they dismissed classes, and we went home for the weekend. And honestly. My, uh, that's all that was on all three networks. All we did, the whole family, all America was glued to the television for the next three days. And on Sunday, when they're taking Lee Harvey Oswald out of the uh, police station in Dallas, my father and I were sitting there watching. And that's when Jack Ruby shot uh, Lee Harvey Oswald live on television. My father and I looked at each other and go, did that just happen? I mean, I was a 12-year-old kid. My father's there, and we're looking like, that guy just shot him on national television. It was more than memorable, indelible. Um, America must have obviously mourned for a, a, a long time. Do you think, in a way, that helped the Beatles? Because in February 64, just enough time had passed. You had had an awful Christmas, and these foreigners come over and it's okay really for them to be smiling because they're not from america do you think actually in a crazy way and kennedy of course would have loved the beatles wouldn't he but do you think that helped them absolutely i remember watching something called the jack parr show in december and he came before he had clips of them as this was a friday night program i got to stay up late and uh he had clips of the Beatles. He said, now, I want you people to watch this. This is what's happening in Great Britain right now. It's a frenzy. These kids are coming over to the U.S. They've been booked for January. So I just want you to watch this. And I saw it. And I went, whoa, these guys are cool. Look at the way they're dressed. Look at the way they sound. Look at the girls. <laughs> and and uh, so I knew what was coming. And um uh, there was a big buzz going around even before they got here, but certainly by the time they got here, it was the pandemonium had been built in already before they landed. 
Well, I'm saying we're talking about big moments, Bill. Um, I also want to ask you about 9-11. Yeah. And that's because, of course, that was just so massive. And I can remember my wife and I were walking past uh, a shop that in those days sold lots of TVs and they would just stack them up like they used to do. And we yeah. saw the first plane had hit. Um, in fact, we had heard about it, but we thought it was just a light aircraft, a tiny little plane that, you, you know, because we'd only heard about it. Then we saw the pictures from CNN. And we went home and we were glued to the television. It's what we three, three and a half thousand miles away from you guys. And we watched the TV for 24 hours. You, I guess you were either on the air or you just drove to the station. What happened for you for 9-11? I was home on that morning, on that Tuesday morning. And a friend of mine called and said, turn on the TV. A plane just hit the World Trade Center. And I go, oh, wow. So I turned on the TV. And that was exactly the moment the second plane hit the tower, hit the second tower. And I mean, we're all in shock. But the very first reaction I had, I am hopping in my Jeep and I'm going in. I am going in. I want to be there. I want to see. Because our studios at KTU at the time, were, like I say, directly across the river from the World Trade Center. And I mean, they, those towers were so much more imposing than the tower they have there now. They looked from across the street like you were right in front of it, from across the river. right. It looked like it was across the street and not across the river. And when the towers started coming down, by the time I got there, it was difficult to get to work. They had... Police had closed off all the streets. Uh, nobody was allowed to get through, but I had a press pass and uh, I knew a couple of the cops and they let me through and I got to the radio station. When I got there, everybody was gone except the producer for the morning show and the engineer, the board operator for the morning show. And they were just simulcasting a television station's constant news coverage. And I said, we got to take advantage of this only to the point where let the listeners call in and tell us what's going on because one way or another, something like that is going to have a domino effect all around the listening area. Not only with people you're worried about, but places you can't get to children. You can't pick up from school people who are trapped. All, I mean, it was like more than just what was happening. It was a million different sub stories going on at that time. And I knew that. So I got on the air and I said, okay, here's the format for 15 minutes, one quarter hour, the first quarter hour of every hour, we're going to go on, take live calls, give updates of information coming into us. I had the producer actually feeding me information from uh, different organizations, clubs, police departments, uh, municipalities that were, you know, making laws and changing things immediately on the fly. And then taking phone calls from people who had a plethora of problems that occurred because of this. And then there were fo some phone calls from people who are deathly afraid that their loved one died. And I got to tell you, when those towers actually crumbled, there were people out in front of the radio station on their knees, crying and praying, watching it come down. Because the radio, like I said, we were right across the river and you, they were on their knees, World Trade Center's coming down and they're crying, their hands in the air. And that's an indelible sight, again, that you can't get out. It, it's just the kind of thing you'd go wow, what's happened to the world? And, you know, I'm here. I'm right here right now um, trying to stay present. And a uh, lot going on that day. And, and here again, aside from John Lennon uh, dying, that was probably the most monumental moment in my broadcast career. What is it about guys like you and I that uh, the radio station becomes a magnet on a day like that? When Diana died, uh, it was a Sunday. I wasn't working. I drove to the radio station and I went on air um, and I opened up the phone lines. The program director put me on air and we opened up the phone lines. What makes us want to get behind a microphone? What is it in our psyche? I'm very sure it's 
excessive fandom. <laughs> We're media superactives at heart. We are, we've been super actives from the time we were children. We soaked up everything coming out of the television, everything coming out of the radio, everything coming out of the record player. We soaked it up like a sponge. And when the opportunity arises, we're ready to unleash it back out, let it go back out. I know what this is all about. I was watching television when Kennedy died. I know how to handle this. And I'm going to get in there and handle this. And that's what it is about guys like us. We know exactly what to do instinctively because we've always been media superactives and we've watched it, how it's done on other occasions in our life. A couple of years after um, 9-11, Bill, I'm with my family on holiday. We are in Central Park. My son wants from the Central Park Zoo, he wanted a little key ring of a polar bear. I go to buy the polar bear. The guy says, my cash register's not working. Go and ask them. We ask them, their cash register's not working. We look over to the, where the woman rink is and we see that the fun fair rides, the big Ferris wheel was stopped. And then it seems two minutes later, people are pouring into Central Park as we're trying to get out. It's the big power outage. And I'm there with my wife and three small children and there are people with transistor radios. Listen, it was like the Kennedy thing in a way where people were just going over to yellow cabs and listening to the radio thinking what the hell has happened. And I was frightened because I thought this is another terrorist attack. Where were you, what, well, I guess 2003, where were you the day of the power outage? I was on the air and the power went out. <laughs> I was on the air and the power went out and it's kind of amazing, but even though it was daylight when it started, um, the inside the hallways was deathly dark and it got dark pretty quickly. Cause I think it was about 3 PM in the afternoon when that happened. Mm. And um, fortunately we did have a backup generator and we did have a backup transmitter site in Jersey that we were able to use. But here again, Phone calls pouring in as soon as I could get it back on the air. I don't think my signal was as strong as it had been because it was just a backup transmitter in Jersey. So we were able to get through it. But here again, same thing. We treated it just like 9-11. We treated it just like an important major event. And I and everybody else in New York was feeling the exact same thing you were. Is this it? Are we at war now? Is this attack number two? You know? Yeah, because we were hearing on the radio, Summer Canada's out, all of Detroit's out. Oh, you know, now this went on for miles and miles and miles. People stuck in the subway, people, you know, walking out of uh, subway stations, get, getting off of trains. It just stopped. I mean, it was everything. And I, I just, it, it, it just came to me. Now, you've been quoted as saying that the DJ is all but gone, which is tragic. But I guess the writing's been on the wall for the last few years. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, you know, the DJ in and of itself uh, is kind of fading away because now it's the multimedia platform star. Um, when I got into the business, every program director, every mentor I ever had said, no talking on the phone unless it's necessary. You're doing a contest. Don't be distracted concentrate on what you're doing, concentrate on how the mix is, concentrate on how your voice is, concentrate on what you're going to begin, middle, and end with, concentrate on all of that, and don't get distracted. And there were program directors back in those days in the 1970s who would actually find disc jockeys for not being prepared, uh, for sounding ill-prepared on the radio. And so when I came into this business, I was taught that with a whip. And now we're, we're personalities who are on our phones texting back and forth. Uh, we're on uh, YouTube cutting a video, watch me, you know, and we're doing everything but concentrating on the air sound, concentrating on what's coming out of the speakers, concentrating on knowing what you want to say exa exactly, you know, because all these other social media platforms and internet platforms have gotten to be so important that radio and i was told this by uh, uh vice president of a major broadcast outfit here in the states said radio from now on is going to be a pathway to our internet 
platforms, whether it's our social media platforms, our website, our uh, parent-owned company website that is funneling all of our signals into their app. Um, the radio station in and of itself, I mean, we can mourn the loss of the disc jockey, but really what you're mourning is the loss of the radio station being the destination for the listener, because now it's only a part of the destination. Now the, des the radio actually is moving you toward other platforms, only, not only by what the DJs are doing and saying and telling, but also by the way that the radio station is platformed on apps, platformed on internet, platformed on still, thank God, the, the dashboard of the automobile, because that's what's saving the uh, frequency modulation at this point. A lot of us now, we get in our car. Maybe we wouldn't if we had you on our radio here in the UK. I mean, I wouldn't. I'd be listening to you every day. We get in our car. The first thing we do is we plug our iPhone into the car uh, and then on our dash we get Spotify and we've already picked a fabulous playlist. The days of sticking a cassette in and after 45 minutes you turn it over and four or five plays, you, it's driving you crazy. That's all gone. So that really has got to be, uh, that, that is a real danger sign for guys like you and I. Yes and no. Um, you can only do that so long. I've noticed even on long distance car trips that... I've got the best, I have all my favorite songs I've ever wanted to listen to on the road. And after about three hours, it's too much. I want to be surprised. I want you to play something I'm not expecting. I want you to surprise me with a song I haven't heard in a really long time. And I didn't even know I liked it that much, but it's been 10 years since I've heard it. And I like it more now than I did then. You know, there's that kind of interaction that happens with radio that is not going to really go away you can put it on another platform but unless you have an air personality who's guiding you through that process who's actually holding your hand and giving you information about remember that song you probably even don't remember who performed it but the bow you know and then you'll go oh right that dude was on tv yeah you know and these are the things that i think are going to keep at least this form of media relevant for a long time. Even if you're in an AI automobile and you're not even driving and you don't need to just listen, you can watch, you can go to sleep, you can do whatever you want. You know, as soon as the automobiles start driving themselves, then we're going to have a real lowering of, of <laughs> radio. <laughs> you know. the other, of course, the other thing is, you are a companion. So if you play Bob Seger, Hollywood Nights, followed by, I don't know, um, the Commodore's Brick House. And, and you're there between the songs and you are keeping me company, you are giving me information. But more importantly than that, you are my friend. I listen to you every day on my, work, on my drive home from work or you are keeping me company at work. You're a companion and, and, and Spotify can't do that. Not only, sometimes I'm singing with the songs. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. Companionship is second, I think. And there's a, I have a priority of things that I do why I'm on the air. First, uh, I aim to entertain your brain. Second, I'd be able to run that lip with a piece of companionship. That is the second most important thing I am there for. Because people want a little companionship or company on the drive, especially if you're alone in a car. All right, now you get the choice. You can either have another clip of you or you can have a clip of me working. What do you want, Bill? Oh, let's see you. No, I'm kidding. They don't want to see me. <laughs> they want to see you. And you ah. really want to see you because you're a DJ. And it doesn't matter who, who you are, how nice you are. For DJs, it's always about them. So let's do you, Bill. Okay. CBSFM, it's Broadway, working this radio.com station. Aside from the inauguration, it's National Disc Jockey Day. Celebrating those of us who gave you that Millie Vanilli CD up in the attic. Music with no static. The t-shirt you used to polish your car and the bumper sticker you haven't been able to scrape off so far. All those promotions and schemes, even living through shattered dreams. But it's gonna be okay. Wow, that is so cool. Broadway Bill Lee, 
that uh, that is your home setup now we see there so yeah. when we went into lockdown it looks like cbs were really good to you over here um you know you'll get a microphone i've done this before for the bbc and they will bring a comrex unit to your house which is i guess just a connection and then there's someone back at work playing the music and talking to you down your headphones but you've got a lovely box of tricks there i can see on that video you had a laptop it looked like you've got a mini mixer with uh, you, you know you can see you pressing effects there and then you've got a little white box of tricks on the side so what did cbs <laughs> send you <laughs> it's difficult to explain because here we're only doing voice tracking and i refused because i've done voice tracking for years and it generally pays poorly and when you do it when you voice track you generally just say oh let me knock this out in 20 minutes i've got a four-hour show let me do you know 16 20 25 breaks and i'll knock it out in uh, 45 minutes and just not care uh i learned to do it well at sirius xm satellite radio when i worked there between jobs that was also voice track. You go into a little phone booth size studio and you voice track a six hour show. And I wasn't working anywhere else at the time. So this was it. Um, this is what I'm going to be known for. So I wasn't throwing it away. I was not just getting it done, getting it out, getting it in, bang. Just don't step on the vocal. You know, I wasn't doing that. I was putting a lot of time, effort, and uh, preparation into, this, into that show. So when the pandemic hit, and I'm working at CBS, I kind of knew that there's a way to do this right, and it can be done right. And as soon as I had the technical ability to make it right, I started really working on it. And the radio station gave me a laptop with the program that, you know, it's totally encrypted so that no one can get into our operating system. And it feeds our operating system, and I can just go right between the songs, or into the commercial set right there from my home. And the beautiful thing about it is they gave me all the disc jockeys kind of conspired. And we, we talked among ourselves, you know, what microphone works, you know, with this computer. And, and they did give us, fortunately, a little Yamaha unit, that little white gear you see off to the left of where I broadcast from in the basement. And that is basically an interface but it has a reverb and a compressor on it and because we have no way to control the volume of what's on that track of music the only thing i can control is my my voice my mic so i need there are some songs that are recorded so loud the only thing i can do is double compress reverb pack to the sky and, and make it over that song. And sometimes I have to just yell to get over it, but I can get over it. And once I started realizing that I could do that, my boss called me up and said, hey, I noticed all these guys over at uh, iHeartRadio are using this Roadcaster Pro. You want one? I said, yeah. <laughs> so that's when he sent me the Roadcaster with all the little fancy uh, you know, digital slots for being able to throw in sound effects and audio beds and even actualities from uh, news stories and all that. I can, I can feed it anything and just hit the button as it, in fact, it's almost a little more convenient than my studio back in New York city is in some instances, but you know what I miss? I miss the phone calls. I used to have a very phone active show in New York until the pandemic hit. I would usually run a, uh, a 30 second phone call that I would edit the heck out of to make sure number one, it was relatable. Number two, it was entertaining. And number three had something to do with what I was talking about. And I would use at least one or two an hour uh, phone calls. And then I also had sound effects made up of listeners. I mean, we'd have jingles, Broadway Bill on CBS FM, you know, and then I would run a listener saying something ridiculous into that uh, or something, you know, totally off the wall into that. And it would just be the person like, I want to have your baby Broadway bill on CBS FM. You know? And I missed that because I had all that from the phones. I would edit all that material, all those drops out of the phone calls. And I don't have that capability now. And it's a shame. I was thinking I can take phone calls, but I'm, I 
feel bad about changing the radio station's number so that the listener can talk to me. I'm still thinking if this lasts much longer into this year, I may just get a burner phone and put the phone number on Facebook and just tell anybody on Facebook, hey, if you want to call me, call me between three and four and let's chit chat. But I haven't got a, I can't, You know, at the radio station, we've got 15 lines. Okay, hold on. I'll be with you in a minute. Okay, you're good. Let's go now. Okay, let's, I mean, like, when you can't do that, it's a whole different animal. Right. Let's get a little bit personal now, uh, Bill. Okay. Um, I I, I hear Howard Stern, we all hear Howard Stern is on $100 million a year plus. um, And that is amazing and good for him. He's incredible. So let me, because these are the things I wonder about. can you you work in Manhattan on your wages? Can you afford to live in Manhattan? No, heavens no. In fact, very few people who work in Manhattan can afford to live in Manhattan unless you're in very close quarters, have roommates, or make an exceptional amount of money with no family to, you know, uh, have to pay for. So I, I mean, I lived in Manhattan for. Gosh, about five years, my wife and I lived there and we had our first daughter there and we had a fabulous place, the kind of place where you have the doorman, you have the taxi cabs out front always waiting. And it was just a wonderful time, but it had its place. As soon as the kids started coming, you know, it just you can't schlep kids around Manhattan. It's just not a good thing. You want more space. You need a different place. But as far as affording Manhattan, it's really crazy now. It's, it's almost unheard of. A lot of the people who work in our promotions department and some of the new DJs who just got to New York live in Manhattan because that's their time. You know, and when you first get there, you definitely want to live there so you learn it. Um, but I've been very fortunate because I've been in New York twice now. I worked uh, at Hot 97 It was originally called Hot 103. We changed frequencies to 97. I worked there from 1986 to 1991. And then I went to San Francisco and worked at KML. Then I came back in 1996 to work at KTU. And when I came back, they they treated me like a star. They had a limo for every gig I did on Friday and Saturday night. And I would watch the limo drivers and see where they were going and ask him to take me through different neighborhoods. And the thing about New York, just like London, actually, it's a lot of little neighborhoods. It's a, it was never really a melting pot so much as a lot of little neighborhoods that get along with different cultures and different neighborhoods. And I love that about New York, but I didn't learn that until 1996, a good 10 years after I started working in New York. Bill, listen, it's been a real treat to speak to you. Um, I'm so glad that you've gone viral with these breaks. You are keeping the art of the disc jockey alive and you do it better than anyone I've ever seen before. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Oh, AD, take it from Broadway, Bill Lee. You just stay calm, kiss your mom, ban the bomb, do the best you can. God loves you, man. Stars, Cars, Guitars was produced by Tom Stroud.